the urologist kept describing my cancer as a rare bird that was called small cell carcinoma. And I'm going, oh no, <laughs> this is like really bad. Uh, I'm sort of chuckling today, but uh, I wasn't chuckling before. And then friend after friend would just speak up and tell me how much they supported me. So in turn, when I took the psilocybin, I don't think I've ever experienced, ever, the gratitude that I felt. And gratitude for what? It was just gratitude. I don't like to talk about it because it's really beyond words. Psilocybin is the psychoactive component in 180 species of psychedelic mushrooms. It's made a comeback within science as a research tool to treat various disorders such as distress with terminal cancer, addiction, depression, or some of the clinical targets being explored. Close to 40% of Americans at some point in their life will get cancer, and of those that get cancer, about half will have some diagnosable psychiatric disorder if untreated is associated with a bunch of very bad outcomes including depression, hopelessness, suicidality, even decreased survival rates from the cancer. But the, the spiritual, psychological, emotional, existential distress, that despair, is harder to reach. Doctors are not trained how to help patients deal with a spiritual crisis or emergency or any of that sort of thing. Psilocybin, it appears, targets this existential or spiritual distress. I was really surprised that it worked because in our cancer trial we found one dose of psilocybin had immediate reductions in anxiety and depression and it lasted for weeks to months which is a unique finding in psychiatry. Some have used these drugs to journey into the uncharted tunnels of the mind in search of medical and scientific truth. Others look behind the curtain just for kicks. We can look back at the 50s and 60s and 70s and, and the research came to a grinding halt when all those, there were these social, cultural, legal changes of the 60s. So we're very mindful of the past. And people can get in a lot of trouble. So I worry people would look at this research and say, okay, this is safe to use. And really, it's not. The only way this should be used is a highly regulated, controlled, structured environment. And it's not just a drug experience, it's a medication-assisted psychotherapy experience. So preparation, the experience, and the integration of what happened contribute to it being powerful. It isn't just in the molecule itself. I had uh, the medicine, the psilocybin, on December 9th of 2000. 13. Yeah. We have three preparatory sessions and form a really safe uh, kind of container. The psilocybin is stored in a little black bottle within a 900 pound safe and it's weighed every day and two people record it. Everyone holds hands, the patient states their intention. And in a little bit of a nod to ritual, we take this chalice here and we take it out of the bottle here. They will put it into their mouth and, and swallow it. When the person feels the effects of the drug, well, we would ask them to put their eye shades on. And Tara, you want to put the headphones on? And then this is the default position for hours. Two therapists sitting here. We check their blood pressure every half hour, but we essentially sit here in a kind of meditative stance for a long time. And I lay there and nothing happened. And at one point I said, why is this taking so long? And Jeff came over and he, he knelt right by me and he said, Eddie, it's taking exactly as long as it needs to, you know. Um, and then it seemed like right after that, I just took off. It all takes place in one room. The participant is not allowed to leave the room. They're even given a hand when they get up and go to the bathroom. So there's a complete safety physically. They may have experiences of fear, sadness, anger, and in fact, most people do have a very emotional experience. We consider that to be part of the healing process. And my face, my face was like, I, it felt like uh, comedy and tragedy in my face. And I, I said to Jeff and Drew, I said, you know, I, I may look shattered to you, you know, like, I. But I, there was so much feeling, and you're kind of up there in 
a very celestial environment, but it wasn't, for me, it wasn't visual. It was corporal, but it wasn't just confined to my eyes. And maybe that's why you wear a blindfold. I don't know. But I, uh, I just started, they didn't want me to talk, so I just started, <laughs> you know, I just started using my hands. Um, you know, I want to live a long life, you know? <laughs> you know, I want to live, I, I don't want cancer to come back, you know? And in some ways, I think I'm better equipped to be with whatever life throws at me or presents, let's say presents. But that doesn't mean that I'm without anxiety. It doesn't mean that faced with something that I don't like, it doesn't mean that I won't despair, but I think that I'm better equipped to face it. And I think I'm also better equipped to appreciate the good things, you know? Honestly, that's another thing that the medicine is telling me is I'm grateful for my life, you know? I'm grateful to be alive um, in a way that I didn't know I could be grateful. Um, much more than getting a nice scarf or even a fancy car, you know? It's a kind of gratitude that it's ineffable. Thank you.